presenting Matt Taggart talking about free standards. Thanks. So, so uh, this is a BOF, and uh, what I would mostly like to do is just have a discussion about free standards and, and how they affect Debian. Um, but I prepared some slides uh, to kind of give some background for people who may not be familiar with what's going on in the, uh, the free standards world first. So what I'd like to do is just go through those and only take a few minutes, but hopefully they'll get the discussion going and then we can um, uh, start discussing things from there. Uh, so I'm Matt Taggart and uh, I work for people at Packard. And one of the things that I do for HP is I'm HP's uh, representative um, to the Linux standard base and uh, look after uh, free standards related stuff for HP. Okay, so the first thing I'd like to do is talk about uh, various different uh, free standards efforts that are going on in the community. Um, a lot of these are um, uh, associated with a group called the Free Standards Group, which was actually created after the LSB as kind of a parent organization to help uh, foster the, the uh, LSB and other uh, um, uh, kind of uh, starting uh, free standards efforts. So um, the Free Standards Group uh, has uh, various different work groups. Uh, the one that most people know about is the Linux standard base. Also in uh, Debian, we're very familiar with the uh, file system hierarchy standard. Um, uh, in addition, there's also uh, an open uh, IETN group that works on internationalization issues. Uh, Lalana, people might know about. Um, open printing, accessibility dwarf, um, and uh, a few other uh, work groups that are just getting started. Uh, I'm going to cover these more in detail in a minute. Um, so the FSG consists of members uh, uh, from the corporate world, nonprofit world, and also individual sectors. And uh, it's pretty easy to become a member of the FSG um, if you're a corporation. It's just a matter of getting money. Uh, nonprofits and uh, individuals are able to join um, pretty much for free as long as uh, they can show that they're contributing. And SPI is a member. Uh, BDL points out SPI is a member of, uh, of the Free Standards Group. Uh, so it's a nonprofit. It's run by a membership elected board of directors. Uh, I think there's uh, nine uh, directors, and, and they're um, explicitly taken. Uh, there's a certain number of seats assigned to each of the three different uh, membership sectors. So I think there's a couple corporate uh, directors, a couple nonprofit directors, and maybe four uh, uh, people who just represent individual uh, open source uh, developers. Um, and the Free Standards Group maintains a small staff of an executive director. Um, and then they um, uh, hire some contractors that uh, explicitly work on some of the, uh, the work groups um, in cases where it's kind of nice to have somebody who's being employed full time to look after things. You know, uh, the, the various work groups are basically open source efforts and sometimes it's kind of nice to have somebody who's able to dedicate their full time to it to really help um, keep things flowing. Okay, so uh, probably the FSG's largest work group is the, um, the Linux standard base. Um, so just a, a couple quick points about the LSB. Um, uh, the LSB is a binary development standard. Um, this is something that differs a lot from POSIX and other uh, Unix standards in the fact that um, it's not just about source compatibility and uh, source uh, APIs, it's about ABIs and about um, being able to have uh, binary portability of applications across Linux distributions. Um, the LSB is kind of interesting in that it specifies interfaces and not implementations. So for example, the LSB will say something like, you must have uh, a, a library called libc and it must have these uh, um, you know, symbols in it. Uh, and it doesn't explicitly say you will have glibc version um, 232 or something like that. It, it just specifies the interfaces. Um, so the interesting thing, thing about that is that what that means is that it allows for competing implementations. So right now, all the LSB uh, um, compliant distributions are all using glibc, but if somebody wanted to, they could go off and implement, you know, their own interfaces, their own um, uh, libraries uh, for these various different things. Um, so, for example, you know, um, if a commercial Unices like uh, HPUX or AIX or Solaris wanted to go off and implement the LSB, they wouldn't necessarily have to do it with glibc. They could write their own libraries that were LSB compliant. And the idea is, is that um, this allows us to uh, have competing implementations moving forward. Um, so we don't ever get locked into one particular implementation. Uh, okay, so the LSB produces uh, various different things, uh, the most important of which is, is the written specification. Um, there's also test suites that will um, help you check your runtime implementation to see if you're um, compliant with the written specification. Um, the work group also produces a sample implementation, which is useful for people who are 
um, developing uh, LSP applications because they can run them on top of a sample implementation as a way of testing that, um, that their uh, application is indeed uh, binary portable. Um, there are also uh, development tools uh, to help you develop LSP applications. Um, and then there's also a certification program um, that uh, LSP runtime implementers and LSP application implementers um, can, uh, can actually get their application certified as being compliant. Okay, so as far as how this affects Debian, um, Sarge was nearly LSP 2.0 compliant. There were a couple of libc symbols that we were um, different on. Um, and uh, there were a couple other tests that we failed um, that were actually deficiencies in upstream um, that uh, the certification program granted um, exceptions for. So, um, uh, it, deficiencies in the standard or deficiencies in our upstream source provider? Uh, well, deficiencies in the upstream source, but I would also say that's a deficiency in the standard because the standard shouldn't have specified something that wasn't in upstream. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, Etch is nearly 3.0 compliant. Um, 3.0 added a couple things, namely uh, loop standard C++. Um, and uh, so there's still some things that are being sorted out there. So Jeff Laquia um, has been working a lot um, on tracking this stuff lately and trying to figure out what we need to do. Uh, Jeff, do you want to talk a little bit about how that um, stuff is working? Sure. You have no more than five minutes to talk about the magic linker hack. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Is that one live? Hello? Okay. Um, as Matt said, I've been working um, on actual, actually doing a lot of the um, LSP testing and trying to find bugs and filing bugs and you know, trying to figure out some of these problems. Um, at one time, um, Progeny was able to certify a um, version of their um, Woody-based componentized Linux for, uh, against the uh, LSP version 1.3. And I believe that since then, Roger So has done one against 2.0. Is that right? That's what I thought. Um, the issues surrounding um, getting the LSB, uh, getting LSB compliance basically have to do with um, making sure that you pass the tests. Um, the, the specifications um, are mostly POSIX plus a few additions like the FHS and so on. But really, the tests sort of determine whether they will, if they will give you certification or not. Yes. Uh, one question from me would be, wouldn't it be possible to run the LSB CO tests or, or start to run them right now, something like once a week and put the size on the web page? Because that would, make, yeah, would enable the least team to, to push all people into really be uh, LSB CO comp uh, compliant. And our current release policy is more or less says, if you're not compliant, you are a C buggy. So, yes. We have a dead bug. Glad you asked. Um, actually, um, I believe. That's a bit question for the. For the microphones. Um, first of all, I think Matt has a um, repeat question. Uh, yeah, to repeat the question, the um, question was, why don't we run the tests uh, for LSB 3.0 and put them on a web page? Um, the answer to that is we do. Um, first of all, Matt has a web page that where he um, collates a list of um, LSB bugs, um, which I'm, I guess he's getting ready to pull up. Um, also, I have made some of my test results um, available on hackers.progeny.com uh, slash tilde laquia. That's L-I-C-Q-U-I-A for those of you without omniscient spelling uh, capabilities. Spell it again. So is it hackers? Hackers. Hackers.progeny.com slash tilde L-I-C-Q-U-I-A. And it'll be under there, so go ahead and hit that. Should be an LSB. Yeah, there it is. And there should be an LSB three in there somewhere. You can see results here. Most of these are from the LSB one point well, three timeframe. Okay. What? Well, <laughs> yeah, there, there, there you go. There it goes at the, the bottom. bottom. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, Right now I have results for Progeny Debian 3.0, which is a basically a Sarge as of two weeks before release. Um, I will be adding more results against uh, newer stuff, including regular Sarge. I would really like to see this Edge, because for Sarge is now released. 
I really would like to be able to say that this time the edge is, L L is LSP compliant with the exception of some MTAs that we don't care about. <laughs> well, um, edge is definitely important. We definitely want to make sure edge is LSP compliant and that it can be certified after release. However, um, there is also a significant amount of interest, uh, especially in the drivers community, on having an LSP compliant SARGE. I, I, don't, um, I don't disagree with that, but of course, we, I'm now speaking about how to manage the next step of stable release of Debian. Right. right. So well, that's certainly an issue. LSP compliance without a footnote, basically. So I wanted to address the question too. Um, Right now, to run the test suites, uh, it's kind of an interactive process and, and needs to be done by hand. And so uh, um, it requires, uh, Jeff and I have been basically the only people that have been running it, and I haven't been able to keep up recently, but here I'll show you on the testing results. Uh, for some of the older testing results, um, uh, I would generate reports and, um, let's see here, I'll actually let me look at the one for you start. And, uh, and generate a nice uh, table format where I would, um, uh, do what I was calling an annotated summary of the results. So I would go through the, the failures and then in line I would put um, kind of these color-coded things about whether or not this was actually a problem. Um, and you can see a lot of these are green, which means there are actually waivers for them at the certification program because they're either a test suite deficiency or a, a specification interpretation issue. Um, there's a couple in here that are, that are red um, that we need to figure out what's going on. Um, so we're doing all this by hand um, because the upstream tests um, require that you answer a lot of questions when you invoke them and that kind of thing. So the interesting thing is that um, uh, somebody from SUSE actually wrote an expect script that wraps around all this and, and feeds it the answers that you want. And I haven't had a chance to take a look at it yet, but, but what you alluded to is a good idea, which is what we really ought to do is have this stuff running on a weekly basis where um, the system, you know, we take a, a, a true or a full system that's running unstable and, and get it up to date. Actually, we could have multiple trues, you know, we've got one for unstable, one for testing, um, and then have automated um, test running. And what all that, what, what it's going to take to do that is just, you know, somebody sit down and, and set all that up. I have a couple dedicated machines, one for uh, i64 and one for i36, and if I could get PowerPC and S390, maybe I'll set that up. But the idea is that we should be able to run it on all the LSP architectures on a regular basis. Well, it's easy. I mean, I have access to almost all architectures. It means to to eleven of the architectures we are running. If I am here one architecture, uh, and I can set up such, such a thing and then any of these meshes to say, okay, this time once a week, <coughs> in my and I even have GN suit for for all of the things mm -hmm. because I'm running a build demon there. So it's okay. sufficient for me to. So what? So stuff. what we need to do then, I think, is is get this automated with the expect yeah. stuff. Make it and then, and uh, yeah, and ideally, you'd put it in a package or something, and that you know installs a cron or something. You just install it and it just runs it for you. Because yeah. uh, it'd be nice for uh, uh, more than just Debian to be able to run this too. You know, the other people who are uh, driving their distributions from Debian, it'd be cool if they had an automated way to, to do the test suites. Right now, um, I have uh, some instructions uh, back on this main page here. Um, let's see where it is. Um, I have instructions here on what it takes to run the test suite. So right now, when people ask me how do I run the test suites on on a, a Debian drive, you know, on a Debian based distro, I can point them at this document. Um, <laughs> Upstream provides the test suites in RPM format, so you have to install them with Alien, um, and you have to do some other trickery to get them to work. Um, and actually, that's something that's being worked on upstream as well. So there are instructions in here on how to run the, the major test suites. Okay, so uh, let me go back to the slides. Are there any other questions about that stuff? I have just a point of curiosity. Um, why are the tests so interactive given that, you know, it's pretty obvious that something like a conformance suite is something you're going to want to be able to automate? Yeah, so um, the tests are based on uh, TET, which is something that is provided by the open group. Um, and basically what the tests are outputting is um, uh, a journal file and, and actually a written report, and that's how you do certification. So it runs uh, this test, and so the kind of questions that it's asking should, are pretty easy to automate, it's just a matter of setting up that expect script, but it's asking you, um, what is the name of the product that you're running on, um, what is the name of the engineer who is going to be submitting these reports, um, and then there's a few other questions too, um, 
uh, the information that the tests need in order to be able to run some loopback file system tests and that kind of thing. And it has to prompt you for the root password, which is kind of tricky because when you're automating that and expect script, you know. It sounds like the kind of stuff that a comp file would be able that would be, would be Yeah, so ideally this would be solved upstream and, and I'm trying to fight that battle in the LSP work group to try and get that fixed. Yeah, well, the open for group, now we have to work, you know, have to work around it. Knows, so. Yeah. Strictly speaking, it is possible to uh, generate that comp file. Um, through other means. As long as the comp file exists, a lot of the questions get skipped. The main question is making sure you get the comp file just right. And generally, it's easier to just, you know, okay, I, I just want to run the test, so I just type run tests and answer my questions. Uh, so some of it is laziness, as with, as with many things in the computing world. Um, I also wanted to talk a little bit about something that I've been work the thing I've been working on recently. Um, it was my observation when working with Woody, uh, I did a set of um, uh, packages, uh, updated packages with patches that made Woody LSB compliant um, and submitted that. Um, it was quite extensive and so um, Joey Schultz uh, um, kind of freaked out when he saw it and said, no way. As far as stable proposed updates, you mean? Uh, yes, for the, uh, for, for the LSB a stuff. Release, yeah. For a point release of Woody, um, which is certainly very understandable. They were extensive. Um, changes to libc, changes to... Well, ABI changes, stuff. right? So we don't allow any ABI changes in the point right. so that's yeah. so, understandable. Um, so now that, uh, so the idea at the time was, well, this is kind of too bad, so we'll have to do this for Sarge. Well, Sarge has now been released, and as has been observed, Sarge has a few problems with the LSB as well. This is caused, uh, in many cases, by some of the needs of some of the other distributions um, requiring certain updates. Um, bugs that are fixed in libc and so on. A lot of these have come in and um, been you know, and, are, and are now uh, required by the LSB and the other distributions don't have a problem but when you freeze your base for what nine months or so um, it kind of makes it difficult to do an LSB update. <laughs> I have both the time. <laughs> it, it kind of makes it difficult to do say a glibc update to fix a bug that the LSB kind of needs. Um, also, the current LSB test scripts, um, part of them test the X window system, and those tests require x.org's XVFB. Uh, this is because there was a bug in x 6 XVFB that the LSB test suite now tweaks, uh, causes the test suite basically to fail and to report completely bogus data. Uh, with all of, the, all of these issues um, and the fact that there still is a lot of interest in Sarge LSB compatibility, I began working on something that I think will mitigate a lot of the problems and actually could make it possible to make Sarge LSB compliant. And this is a dynamic linker hack that uh, I posted about in my blog and I think some of you may have heard of. Wait, but before you move on to that, yes, that's going to blow people's minds. Um, uh, can you can you please file a bug tagged Sarge against XVFB? I'd like to get this taken care of in a point release. We might have to do a point release. Actually, I know we're going to have to do a point release of X386 for Sarge anyway for a security problem. And it's not just me working that. Uh, Franz Pop has volunteered to work on it as well. So, you know, because there's more than one person, there's a non-zero chance it'll happen. Um, I'd really, really like to roll in uh, anything that would help us with the LSB, especially if it's small. And this sounds like some trivial bug fix. So and you have to be able to yeah. get it past Joey. Um, yeah, well, I well I'll I'll bridge when I also to but, um, just to say, yes, we will, definitely will do that. I've been wanting to talk to you about this, by the way. Uh, but you know, conference I'm being what it is. I'm across the hall, man. <laughs> well, that's true too. We work at the same place. So. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Um, as well, another thing I would also would, I really would like to see bug reports. If you say, for example, with uh, GNU-LIBC would have needed an update for Sarge before the release. Actually, we, we had GNU-LIBC updates till, well, yes, very uh, four, four weeks for the, before the release. Uh, everything, if you say you need it for LSP compatibility, please open a CPAC against, uh, against GNU-LIBC and we would have allowed an update. In. Well, we this, is, this was a much more serious bug than the, one, the updates that were going in. We're talking about GLIBC 233, basically. So oh. you both basically would have needed a full GLIBC. Yeah, we're talking, basically... It was really only four symbols, but yeah, technically it would, we would have needed to move to the new version. So. Oh, that's... That sounds also bad. Yeah, yeah that's, that's... And it's mostly just because, like, you know, because we froze the... You know, so even though the updates were going in, we had still frozen on a version a very long time ago. Of course. Yeah, yeah well, um, yeah, well this, this might have gone in until two and a half months before the release. 
For next to these, we have a very short uh, base to these. Only some, some things like about three months or so. I, I feel like we don't find it. But this time we do it. <laughs> and I've heard that before as well. Frankly speaking, there's only one way we can do it. And that is, if you, if you stop all saying, oh, we heard it before, but we really believe it, it works only if we work together, and not if you, all of you just say, we heard it before, it won't do. Yes, we do. I'm really get, getting sick to hear that, hear that again. Mind <coughs> control, man. You need mind control. Yeah, and I'm not sure where the ball got dropped because you know when we when we run the test suites, whenever we turn up problems, we, we file bugs, and I'm not sure exactly what happened here uh, because we do have a bunch of them uh, filed, and we actually have a nice thing that uh, this came up. Don't we have an LSB uh, debugs tag so we can tag? Well, it's a it's a pseudo tag, so you have. Are they all at serious? Um, I don't know the answer to that question. We we. Filed them all at normal, and there was some intent to yeah, upgrade we, them closer to the we, release. We articulated like eight months ago that we wanted LSD compliance for Sarge's release criteria, and given the timing of the freeze and GLC versions, it might not happen anyway. But that suggests to me that all of those bugs should have been in priority series for a while. Although at the, at the time, the criteria was uh, LSD 1.3, and great. Sarge yeah. slipped out. That's long great. enough that it was 2.0. Yeah, I'm not trying to yeah. anybody up, but from here forward, please make all LSB compliance issues serious. So that yeah, so what we really need to do is talk to the release team and, and go ahead and declare now, you know, 3.0 compliance is a, is a goal. They've and done and that, that means make or, possibly <coughs> four, or, or possibly 4.0, depending. Yeah, well, so 4.0 is going to be 18 months out. How about, how about relevant LSB compliance at time of release? Yeah, yeah that, would, that might be workable. You know, start it start it serious and if people want to argue with the severity down, we can have that discussion, but the default should Closer be Closer to the end of the release we'll have a discussion. Yeah. Just leave it alone. And so just it. assume yeah. that relevant LSB compliance at release is a release expectation and file bugs accordingly and let the release team and everybody else figure it out in time. Yep. Yep. Okay. Can you repeat it? Can you well, repeat? Um the repeat. suggestion was that um we should make sure that all LSB compliance issues are serious bugs or are, are higher so that they're release critical. Um, the idea being that um, if we if people tend, if people disagree, that's a debate that can be hashed out, but that that should be the default assumption so that we make sure we have LSB compliance, relevant LSB compliance at the time of release. Yeah, if we're going to deviate, let's do so consciously instead of accidentally. So one more point about the uh, lack of two dot o compliance. Uh, um, we had filed bugs on everything the test suite had turned up, and uh, the missing symbols was something that was turned up by a new test that the LSB added in 2.0 that does nothing more than just looks at the libraries and makes sure all the symbols are there. So um, the LSB test suite is not, uh, does not have 100% coverage. As a matter of fact, it's pretty poor on its coverage, and so it's not testing that everything is there. Um, so we were compliant with what tests were being run, but this one caught us by surprise because it was stuff that we didn't have, and so uh, hopefully we'll get it better next time. And this, leads, hack. and this leads to the dynamic linker hack, the famous dy dynamic linker hack. Uh, one very nice thing about the LSB, first of, well, first of all, I should probably back up a little bit. How many of people know what ELF is, at least outside of the context of Tolkien novels? <laughs> okay, good. For those that don't, ELF is the um, binary format that is used by uh, Linux executables. Um, the interesting thing, which I don't think a lot of people know, and I certainly didn't know until I started working with this stuff, is that um, you've all heard of the bang, pa bang ha the hash bang um, syntax for scripts. The same thing exists for binaries. Uh, the ELF header contains essentially um, a uh, reference to what it considers to be its interpreter. And on most systems, that um, on most executables that you'll see, if you just type GCC and get yourself an executable, it will have a link there to uh, slash lib slash ld dash linux dot so dot two um, in that particular field. Um, that's the famous dynamic linker. Um, the, the dynamic linker is run. It then loads all of the relevant libraries and resolves all of the um, dynamic library um, hooks in the executable and then passes control to the executable. In the LSB... So uh, I, just, I just did a strings on a on a standard binary, and you can see the very first thing that shows up in strings is the, the, this hard-coded path to the linker, so it's pointing at lib ldlinux.so.2. One interesting thing about the LSB is that it mandates that LSB, uh, LSB compliant executables must not use that particular um, interpreter. 
uh, they have to use an interpreter slash lib slash ld dash lsb dot so dot and then a number the number corresponding to the version of the LSB that the particular program is claiming to comply to. Um, most systems, including Debian by default, simply create sim links to create those, you know, LD, uh, slash lib slash ld dash lsb dot so dot everything. And if um, you're LSB compliant, then, you know, it's just a no op and it's easy and the sim link just works. Right. But um, the, uh, the hook was provided so that people who did have issues with providing the uh, LSD, um, for example, if they were running a little behind or a little ahead, could provide a separate dynamic linker that could link in separate libraries just for LSD applications. And that essentially is what I am working on right now. Um, I have got a uh, hacked up version of, G of glibc 2.3.5 that builds a dynamic linker that links, um, that treats uh, libraries in slash lib slash LSB at a higher priority than all other system libraries. So if you have a library that has LSB compliance is issues, you simply build a new package with the changes that you need to make it compliant and put it in slash lib slash LSB or slash user slash lib slash LSB. And then LSB applications will pick it up. The test suites will use it instead of the uh, regular system libraries. And you should be able to pass the LSB without having to change the ABIs for the uh, underlying distribution. That's basically it in a nutshell. Uh, my current status with it is that I have the dynamic linker part working. But since it's a part of glibc, I'm also working on making sure the glibc that goes with it works. And there are issues with the fact that the locale the compiled locale uh, information is incompatible between 2.3.2 and 2.3.5. So it's more of a compatibility issue. So when I run the tests against my um, hacked up with um, libc with the dynamic with the uh, dynamic linker hack, um, I get somewhere in the neighborhood of several thousand uh, test failures, uh, all, nearly all of which are, you know, I can't find my locale. But um, the test failures, like the test failures we had up, whoa, goodness, the test failures we had up earlier, um, some of those um, that was that was on the screen, most of those go away by using GLC two three five. So uh, the hope is that in the future, if um, the hope is in the future, like Etch will release with compatibility just built in, and we won't have to do this at all. The, the slash loop slash LSB and so on will be empty, but. Um, given the fact that we have yet to release in such a fashion, um, if it turns out that we have a problem that we need to fix and perhaps the release team is unwilling to change uh, Etch's ABI, we have a way of working around the problem. And uh, Devin's not the first to use this, uh, this uh, special hack. Um, the LSP team added it back in the 1.0 time frame and since then um, I think both Mandrake and Red Hat have had to use it um, because and in, their, you know, in our case, we're a little bit behind the game in that we're using an older glibc. Um, in Red Hat's case, at one point, they were um, too far ahead and were using a newer glibc and had to provide the old one, you know, kind of an old vibes kind of thing, in order to make sure that it was still there. So it's, um, it was good uh, um, vision by the uh, LSB team originally to realize that this was going to be an issue and to provide this way to do it. So, Questions about that? Anyone? So, so, the, and so the question I have, and maybe part of the discussion we can talk about is uh, whether or not um, such a hack would be uh, suitable for adding to um, a Debian point release. You know, we can set it up in an alternate so app like, archive, like, but... This is like adding a package to the distribution that doesn't... That's correct. So, so basically what it would allow us to do is not break the normal libc ABI on the system and just have this package installed, installed alongside. Based on the conversations I've had with the world release manager in the past, I think it's possible. Please repeat, Jeff. Um, BDO was saying that it seems like it will be possible for this release. I think that's very true. Um, I know that uh, Joey was very, very interested in LSB for Woody, and the, the main problem was that the, the updates were just too much. But he actually like went to some length to try and figure out if there's any way we could get any of it in back in the Woody time frame. So if we can do this without having to, without having to change anything, I don't see it. It seems like a slam dunk to me. Now, obviously, I can't speak for him, but anyway. All right, so I'm going to move on to uh, the rest of my slides. And uh, 
at the end, if there's still time, we can come back to additional questions. Okay, so we talked about the LSB. Uh, quick highlight of the LSB chapters, just so people are aware. Um, these are just the chapter titles, because um, people often ask me what's in the LSB. Uh, introductory Elements talks about the fact that basically we're just leveraging a lot of existing standards, and so um, the LSB really is taking advantage of POSIX and the single unit specification. Basically, anywhere we can point to an existing standard that was already being used by Unices and, and it was pervasive in the community, we just point at that. So the LSB really has to spell out things that are above and beyond those existing standards. Um, there's a chapter on ELF, um, and it talks about the linker stuff. Um, and, and points to uh, um, ELF specifications for what the binaries actually should look like. Uh, there's a chapter on base libraries. This includes, these are mostly libraries that are provided by DLibc um, or the ABIs that are provided by them, so uh, libc, libm, those sort of things. Um, utility libraries uh, are things like libz and um, a few other things. Uh, command and utilities uh, specify um, you know, things that you can expect to find. Um, and uh, I think I pointed this out earlier, but the LSP is a development standard, so it doesn't really talk about what your, um, what kind of utilities you're going to have on your system. It's really only these are things that developers can expect to have on the system. So the, the set of commands is actually fairly small. It's mostly just things that developers would expect to be able to use in uh, install scripts and, and uh, have their packages uh, used to you know, uh, manipulate the file system and things like that. So it's a pretty small um, execution environment. Um, talks about uh, um, things that the, that the applications can expect to find uh, um, on the system, and uh, that includes things like FHS and, and where they should install things. Um, system initialization is really interesting, and this actually came up in HMH's talk um, earlier. Um, the LSB specifies the dependency-based uh, system initialization system, so the idea is, is that it doesn't explicitly specify um, System 5 and its scripts, so basically um, specifies how to do things with dependencies in order to allow for um, other um, init implementations. Um, standardizes on how uh, users and groups work and uh, UID ranges and GID ranges and that kind of thing. This was kind of interesting because uh, um, Debian and, uh, and Red Hat based distributions were slightly different in, in how they uh, dealt with those ranges and so uh, um, that uh, has since been cleaned up and, and the distros are all the same now. Um, and then talks about uh, LSP package format and uh, how to install LSP packages. Okay, uh, another one of the FSG workgroups is Faustus Markey standard. I think everybody in Debian is familiar with this. Um, and uh, a quote from their page that is a, a set of requirements and guidelines for file and directory placement or Unix like operating systems. Um, so currently, Debian policy specifies that uh, we should be FHS uh, 2.1 compliant. The release managers have contacted me and said, okay, what do we think? Do we want to move forward? You know, because FHS 2.3 has been out for a while now, so I think that that's going to be the goal for Edge, and we need to start looking into doing that. Um, the main new features in FHS 2.3 are um, slash SRV, um, which is intended um, for kind of a lot of things that we've been putting in VAR. So, you know, currently in Debian, we use VAR WWW. Um, the idea is that, you know, anything that you're, um, that's data that is going to be used by a service um, that's kind of being exported from the system, you should put in slash SRV. Um, slash media is kind of a replacement for the slash MNT slash CROM kind of hacks that, uh, that all the different distros were kind of different on. So the idea is you have a slash media and then underneath there you have mount points for all your removable media. Um, and then the other thing that it adds is uh, lib64 um, for doing uh, architectures where you have uh, both uh, 32 and 64 bit libraries. Um, we were already working on the multi arch stuff. We and Debian were already working on the multi arch stuff when this got added. And, and I said, hey, you know, it's a really good idea for us to add the um, the lib64 stuff when we think we might come up with a better um, better way to do this, but uh, Red Hat and Sousa had already embraced lib64, so they felt, yeah, it's a good idea to go ahead and add it at some point in the future if we need to. Uh, we'll go ahead and specify multi-arch in the FHS, and uh, lib64 will stay in there as an option for a while until it can eventually be uh, deprecated. Do you think that will cause problems for us in um, Could you repeat that? So, so Beetle asked if he thinks that'll cause uh, problems with us moving to 2.3, so... Uh, can we just make it a simulink? We, we can just put it in there and make it a simulink, and you know, it doesn't say anything about implementation. Basically what it's spelling out is just that if, if an application attempts to install um, to there, it just needs to do the right thing. So if we make it a simulink and it drops things in elsewhere, um, that's fine. And Dpackage follows simulinks when unpacking by yeah. default, so... So that should be fine. 
And eventually we'll be able to make it, you know, if we do multi-arch, we'll be able to make it similar to the right multi-arch location and it should do the right thing too. Okay, next work group is uh, Lalana. Uh, this is the um, Linux Assigned Names and Numbers um, Authority. And Lalana was basically created um, to solve namespace issues. Um, and probably, I think, the, one of the main things that it was created for originally was the uh, Linux device list stuff. So um, basically how uh, um, device uh, numbers are assigned to various different drivers. So uh, that was the first thing that they started out. So in Debian, this affects um, uh, make dev, uh, devfs, and, and udev. Um, but uh, it's turned out that having somebody to manage namespace issues has been a very useful thing. So the other thing that it gets used for now is that the LSP delegates uh, uh, anything, any namespace issue to it. And so this includes things like um, you know, when an LSP package is going to install an op, where they install that. Um, and so uh, developers can, can register a location and op to make sure that there's not going to be a namespace collision. Um, so uh, namespace collision for where they install the package names, uh, what they call their init scripts, what they call, call their cron stuff, uh, that too. Um, and then the other thing that I found on their webpage is this uh, um, Linux own uh, Unicode assignments, which uh, if I understand it correctly is um, uh, a way of map, map, uh, mapping uh, um, character sets to, uh, uh, to Unicode in the kernel. Okay, uh, open ITN, ITN is internationalization. Uh, but this work group looks at internationalization, localization, and multilingualization. Um, it does provide uh, written specifications, um, and these uh, written specifications uh, kind of span all levels, um, from the kernel to base libraries, you know, core utils, that kind of thing, all the way up to desktop um, level stuff. Um, it's kind of orthogonal to the what the LSP is doing and, and what a lot of the other work groups are doing, and that they kind of have their fingers in all places. Um, they also provide tools. Um, implementations of utilities and that kind of thing, um, and also some government outreach to, to work with governments. Um, and uh, Roger So, who I, I think is here at the conference but not in the room, um, is on uh, the Open ITN and Steering Committee. Okay, so there's some other FSG work groups I'll just briefly mention. There's an accessibility work group that's uh, specifically working on accessibility issues, um, uh, namely things like uh, libATK. Um, and uh, associated stuff, and also doing a lot of um, government liaison work. Uh, there's a dwarf group that's specifically tasked with looking at the, um, the, uh, the dwarf debugging format, um, and also an open cluster framework, which is trying to get all the people um, in the cluster space together to um, leverage tools and kind of try and use the same thing instead of everybody inventing their own stuff. Okay, another group that's only loosely affiliated with the FSG that's been doing a lot of good work is freedesktop.org, who I think everybody is uh, um, really familiar with. Um, and uh, they're working on standards for uh, windowing toolkits, uh, window managers, hex extensions, desktop features, you know, um, things that, that a lot of the distros had already been doing and, and Debian is used to, like um, the way that, uh, you know, applications should be able to drop in menu information and line settings and things in, you know, icon, desktop trays and icons and um, how cut and paste and drag and drop and clipboard and trash work and that sort of thing. Um, and they don't actually publish formal ABI standards. Um, they do publish some uh, API stuff, but uh, they basically rely on the LSB to, to take what they produce and, and run with it. And so the LSB has a, um, a desktop uh, um, subcommittee that is basically going off and um, taking what the FSG, or excuse me, what, what freedesktop.org is producing um, and making uh, um, ABI standard modules for that that can be included in the LSB. Okay, so one thing I wanted to point out is um, kind of the difference between free standards and, and existing standards um, and, and kind of why the FSG is different than like ISO or POSIX or the open group or that kind of thing. And um, Free standards are developed as, as free software projects in, in the way that we're all used to dealing with free software uh, projects. So. Um, uses a uh, open publicly archived mailing lists, open, you know, basically all the, all the participation is open. Um, anybody can attend phone conferences and face-to-face uh, -face meetings and, and can get CVS access and um, that sort of thing. But the other thing that's kind of interesting um, is that uh, we don't allow for any IP encumbrance or, or things like uh, what's called RAND, which is uh, reason, what's called reasonable <coughs> non discriminatory. You guys might remember a while back, uh, the WC3 got yes. in, a, in a whole world of uh, heat over uh, 
trying to add some stuff to the standard that was um, uh, required some sort of license fees or something like that. I can't remember what the technology was, but um, unfortunately that got uh, shot down. But uh, but free standards in general, you know, have policy against um, doing any such thing. So the idea is to provide a no strings attached development environment so that anybody who's using the standard can is free to, to, to implement however they want. Brandon? Uh, about RAND, I don't, I don't know if it, or, well, first, how many people in here already know what was meant by RAND when the W3C was toying around with it? Okay, not, not terribly many. Okay, the idea was um, some of the big vendors came to the W3C and said, yeah, you know, we, we know it's not fair for Microsoft to do things like predatory pricing. So as long as you're in a business, you know, everybody gets to pay the same license fee for implementing. And of course, this was just a poison pill against free software because uh, distributors like Debian uh, can't afford to, uh, it, it's not consistent with our free software guidelines to, to, to pay a fee just to implement a standard. So, yeah, so, so to, that, kind, of, that so to kind of repeat what he stuff. said, the, the RAND stuff was kind of explicitly an attempt to um, d divide the, uh, the commercial implementations that were willing to deal with such a clause from the free standards or, you know, or the free software people who um, ethically wouldn't wouldn't want such a clause, and also to some extent, you know, a lot of the people who are doing the implementing uh, couldn't afford either. You know, right. So free from both the free beer and the free speech. Yes. Okay. So one other thing that I wanted to talk about was that the FSG is in kind of an interesting position, and um, and the LSB sometimes takes a lot of heat from um, free software developers who are saying, you know, why do we need this? The the LSB is really um, just about you know making a uh, an environment for uh, proprietary applications. And so um, what the FSG attempts to do is kind of uh, walk this, you know, do this balancing act between um, the free software community and, uh, and the people that we're trying to attract to use Linux in order to uh, um, grow the number of people that are using free software. Um, and so it kind of has to live in the middle where basically what we're trying to do is uh, have a balance between free software ideals and, and develop uh, the free standards in, in uh, the way that meets our ideals, but we don't want to piss off the proprietary developers because we don't want them to deciding that they're going to um, take their toys and go home and go off and implement their own standard that um, isn't as free as we'd like. So, um, so it's kind of hard because uh, um, there are many of us who would like to see the LSB be more of an uh, open source project and, and uh, do things in, in the proper way. Uh, but we have, you know, many of the people who are funding uh, the FSG and, and hence the LSB um, are big companies that are, are trying to push push things the other way. So it's this kind of ongoing struggle. Question. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else an LSB that tries to solve the same problem, like some big companies trying to impose? Um, well, there hasn't been yet, fortunately. Um, I suspect if we ever, so one of the things that's interesting about the LSB is we don't ever include anything uh, we have a license criteria that's actually stricter than the the, the Debian Free Software Guidelines and that um, we say we won't allow anything um, that uh, precludes uh, proprietary implementation. So the, the LSB doesn't ever add anything that um, is under the GPL or any sort of license like that because what we want to provide is a uh, development environment where proprietary developers are free to develop too. Um, I suspect if we ever did add something that was under the GPL, and all of a sudden made it so that proprietary developers could no longer use all the interfaces in the LSB, that the LSB would fork and that um, the proprietary people would go off and create their own standard. Um, so um, so that's kind of why we have the, the license uh, restrictions that we do. Okay. Um, every once in a while, some group somewhere has come up and said, wouldn't this all just be simpler if we had a single reference implementation of what a Linux based system is supposed to be? And we just put that out and got all the distributors to use it, and then there would, in effect, be one standard Linux. The problem with this is it, it plays with that whole freedom of choice thing, which is sort of core and fundamental to the way our community behaves and expects to behave. And the other problem is that most of the people who propose this are people that are coming from sort of the other side of the equation. Their motivations are not exactly pure. What they're trying to figure out is how they can build, you know, one instance of a non open source, non-free software application and make it available to as many of us as possible. And that's, you know, that, that's, it, it's okay for that to be their motivations, but it doesn't necessarily lead them to either have lots of expertise in how to build 
good Linux distributions or uh, to make good technology choices for what should or should not be in the base. And so I've actually been a very strong supporter of the LSB model of addressing the problem because this notion of, of building standards that people can build, you know, competing and different implementations against is one that has worked so well um, for open networking protocol standards and other things like that in the past. I can't imagine that the internet would have become what it is today if it had um, been developed in, in some less open and less um, sort of egalitarian manner. And only one implementation. Yeah, and only one implementation of protocols by, you know, one technical group. And so this really, in some sense, is all about dealing with the hassles and sort of the extra process overhead that comes from an LSB kind of, you know, creating a specification that isn't just, you know, a single body of code. That there's, there's obviously more work involved in doing it this way, but the hope is that in the end, you preserve those sort of fundamental behavioral freedoms that are part of what's made this such a, you know, differentiated and, and valued and, and successful thing for all of us. So, and, and yeah, that's uh, the single largest request that we get is people who come to us and they say, I just want there to be one Linux. You know, they're coming from Windows, they're used to only supporting one thing, and they don't like the fact that there are all these different, you know, distributions, and, and so we get this request a lot, and a lot of people try to solve this problem, and as far as we can tell, the only way to solve it properly is to do it the way we're doing with the LSP, but, you know, to name a couple projects in the past, um, there's been things like United Linux, Linux Core Consortium, uh, user Linux, that kind of thing. All of these, at least one of their goals has been that they want to be the pervasive core um, that everybody builds on top of and they want to solve the problem by just only having one set of bits and one implementation um, because that's seen as kind of the holy grail that everybody wants, um, but then we lose the, the, the diversity that we have with all the distribution. Even Windows isn't just one yeah, people pointed that out too. That yes, yeah, so, so his comment was even Windows isn't just one. You know, people and I, I've heard that before too. That people pointed out, you know, you know, you have several versions of 95, several versions of 98, several versions of 2000, and it, and it, you know, people think it's one version, but it's really different. And, and uh, software developers have to test across all those as well. But uh, but to some extent, um, since they're all controlled by one party, it's still kind of one implementation, even though the ABIs may change from release to release. So. Um, but yeah, it's just, they have a, a similar problem, but uh, they seem to be winning the uh, uh, the marketing war at least, and making everybody think that it's one and the same. So. Uh, Matt, we're about out of time. Okay. As people want to continue talking to launch, launch is the next one. So. Uh, well, let me just hit this for about ten seconds, and then uh, <laughs> I think we're done with my last slide. So. Um, uh, we're always looking for new standard ideas, as you know, you as Debian people, um, if you see things that have emerged as, as a, a good standard, um, or you see things where they're com uh, competing standards, where we ought to really come up with one solution for things, um, think about trying to implement in a way that you can uh, write written specifications uh, for a, a neutral implementation. One of the things in particular I've been uh, talking about is that I've, I've been talking to uh, uh, Keybuck about, you know, hey, when you're doing this new dpackage stuff, if we can write it in such a way that um, it's really not Debian specific, maybe we can get everybody to adopt this new package format and that sort of thing. Um, and basically, it's all about building consensus. You need to involve uh, all the parties in the process, or you're not going to get anybody to adopt because people really like, you know, if they're not involved, they're just going to ignore it. Okay, uh, that's it. I think we're out of time. Are there any last questions before we go on? Okay, thank you.